Uh, yeah, I came over to Canada from England for Nortel, and then after six years it all imploded. So I uh, started a new journey with a small company, three of us from the uh, design interpretive group there at Nortel set up our own small company. And here we are, uh, 14 years later or so, 16 years later, and still going, which isn't bad for small businesses in Canada of which about 80% fail within the first three years. So we're feeling good about that. So what I'm going to talk about is a specific client of ours, a customer of ours that we've done work for and done usability testing for. But it's a particular kind of usability testing. It's about benchmarking. And there are differences between different types of usability testing. And you kind of see some of what's going on here with Cisco. Um, so. Some recent events reminded me of this old Gary Larson cartoon, a very old one. Um, and if you've read that. And of course, I was thinking about the missile alert in Hawaii, which seems to be coming down to an appalling user interface design. But there's already been some discussion that, of course, that's only a, a symptom. And the issues are probably around how government procures its IT, what skills people have, how the teams work, how are they rewarded, what are people's responsibilities. Because often you find in any large organization that the, the organization, the senior managers often have quite clear visions and goals, but they're not connected with the day-to-day -day work of the people down on the ground floor. They get muddled up in the middle of an organization. It happens in government and it happens in large organizations like Cisco as well. So I'm going to talk about Cisco. Do you know who Cisco is? Sorry, my phone is making a few noises. Um, do you know who Cisco is? Okay. Because I, I work with British Telecom, then Nortel, Cisco are a very large telecoms uh, company, um, providing a lot of infrastructure uh, telecoms. That's me. So at uh, Cisco have their own excellent internal UX teams, but they can't deal with everything. Sometimes there are also situations where it's better to have an outsider tell the organization something rather than an insider. You can be a prophet in your own land and people won't listen to you if you're internal, especially if you work for some obscure R&D branch of the company, right? But sometimes a consultant can come in from outside, tell it as it is, you know, pretty much, and, and be listened to more so than an internal person. I also want to mention Jerry McGovern. Do any of you know Jerry McGovern at all? Okay, I thoroughly recommend you, you track him down on the web, loads of videos, loads of stuff. Uh, an Irish guy we've partnered with for many years now, and it was through Jerry that we got the work with Cisco. Uh, Jerry, he's Irish, his background is communications and advertising. Um, the first time I met him, uh, he was running a web workshop. And I had never expected to spend two days laughing about the web. He just communicates so well and such great stories, and yet they are pithy and they are absolutely dead on. So we worked with Jerry for a while, uh, partnering on this work, and it was through him, really, that we got the work with Cisco. So Cisco, you know, they, they do a lot of, as I said, infrastructure stuff for telecoms. Very, very large corporation. Um, I think revenue is even more than uh, 47 billion now, based in San Francisco. Yeah, okay. So big, big, big telecoms company. One of the problems that telecoms companies face is that their technology is so complex. There's just so many products, so many variants, so many boards, so many services. And that's the real challenge that Cisco face. Website gets lots of visits, more and more, um, of course. Um, we also suspect there are, there are specific profiles for, for mobile. So a lot of Cisco's customers are actually vendors and third-party value-added providers. So they're the ones often in companies uh, fixing their telecoms equipment and stuff. And we suspect there's a lot of on-site mobile access to Cisco's uh, support information. One of the things that drove this, this work was a report from Temkin, and uh, they do this annually, but they also provide a lot of UX-based uh, metrics and financial information uh, every year. 
And quite often, uh, an initiative like this in a large organization is driven by a single event or something that triggers the whole thing. And it was a couple of things. One was this and a very senior manager in Cisco meeting with Jerry. And Jerry is just great at talking at very, very senior people and, and getting them to, to get the message. So what this, uh, this report showed was that, so for organizations, so thinking of your most recent interactions with each of these tech companies, how easy was it to interact with the company? So this was a, a survey they made. So you can see here people rating uh, how easy it was to interact with an organization and, and they compared a number of different tech organizations. And then they also asked them, do you plan to purchase more uh, products from your tech vendor? And there's a relationship with easy to interact. Are you likely to try a new product or service? The relationship was even stronger there. So if they, if they trust you and feel you're easy to, to work with, then they're even more likely to try a new service. And of course, the net promoter score, a very suspicious kind of score, uh, is very high. There's been some recent critiques from Jared Spool of the net promoter score, which is uh, worth, uh, uh, worth reading. Um, so that you know, said, OK, easy to do business means more loyal, more committed customers who will buy more and stay longer. And you know, there were other related questions. So that's the other kind of you know, public thing that, that generated the work in, in Cisco. They don't just do usability testing. They do what they call triangulating to the truth. And they use three uh, different types of data uh, to inform their initiative. So they do customer satisfaction surveys quarterly and monthly. They get feedback from the website unsolicited. They do customer interviews and through social media as well. They get metrics around responses uh, on, on social media. Um, this is really where we're involved in task studies, usability testing, ethnographic research and some participatory studies as well. I haven't really seen much of the, the other work going on there. And of course, they use all their site analytics and reports, path analysis, trends, and, and uh, they, you know, data direct from interaction on the website. So this is primarily about the website. And so we, um, with Cisco, every six months, they run a benchmarking usability testing in each of four areas. Pre-sales, support, partners, and services. And I've worked on the, um, the pre-sales ones in particular for about eight years and the support ones for a couple of years now. Uh, Jerry McGovern and some of the folks in the UK do the partners and the services testing. Okay. So each of those does benchmarking testing every six months. Now, one of the other things they looked at in, in order to drive this initiative was multi-channel. So it's not just about the web. And so they looked at what was the first channel of choice for people contacting Cisco. So the web certainly had the most. It was the first choice for 44% of people wanting to contact. Email, 20%, and phone, 18%. So they looked at that. They looked at the outcomes as to whether or not the problems or queries or questions that their customers had were uh, fixed. And so you can see, you know, like, you know, face to face on the phone, there's a much higher resolution, even in email, <coughs> where human beings have to get involved and respond, much more likely to, to fix the problem. Whereas chat <laughs> and uh, the website itself and the community as well uh, don't have such a good record of solving people's problems. And those are all for various different reasons. Those environments are very different. <clears throat> so one of the things you can look at is where's the biggest opportunity? So even though uh, you know, the web is, is better than some of the other areas, because it deals with 44% of queries and because 39% of those are not fixed or not corrected, then there's an opportunity of improving that by 17% overall with that. Whereas, for example, with email, you only end up with a 6% opportunity. So in other words, the web represented the biggest opportunity for improvement for Cisco. So they have focused on that a lot, 
but they have done work in, in other areas. They also looked at what was the second channel of preference. And a general finding was that once people had chosen the channel, they tended to prefer to stick to it, especially people in the communities, right? very uh, loyal or uh, supportive of, of the community. Often the website was uh, second choice. One of the problems in a large organisation for managers is that their time and resources is spread too thinly. Um, I, I st the, the web uh, has just completely changed our world and I think organisations, uh, it, it, it's still in its infancy I think, and organisations are really significantly going to change over the next 50, 100, maybe 200 years. So organisations are really struggling internally with the old silos they have, people working in specific departments, not talking to each other, uh, the way that they procure IT and the way in which platforms are, are bought and import, employed, the skills they have and the roles, those are all new because of the web. So one of the challenges is how to spend your uh, limited resources. And this is where Jerry came in because he came up with this model and we've helped him work it out called um, the a top task management approach. Okay? What happens is if you look at the tasks that people do on a website or the searches they, they make, there are a small number of them that are significantly important to them, way more than all the others. And you can see this, this graph in a number of, of different places. You can see it as you know, sales in a store or something. And if, and if you're Amazon, you, know, you can make money off the long tail, but most people can't make money off a long tail. So managers need to kind of focus on the things that are priorities to their customers, and that tied in with the UX kind of data in, in the report. So we use a particular polling technique that we've developed with Jerry to find out what visitors to a website, what their top tasks are. Okay. And that's what we call tiny tasks. And one of the challenges of any design of a website or anything else is it's all trade-offs. It's all trade-offs. There's no you know, absolute best design ever. Uh, any design decision you know, might strengthen one aspect of a design and, and weaken others. So for, for a website, for example, you have to make sure that the tiny tasks don't get in the way of the top tasks. That it's easy to find the links and the pages and the data and to understand the, the content for the top tasks. And that may mean that the tiny ones do get harder to do. Right? You can't make everything easy, easy to do. Uh, Lou Rosenfeld, another uh, well-known, uh, he wrote the kind of seminal uh, information architecture book, the one with the polar bear on it, way back, right, and he's still going strong. He's come up with the same kind of model. He, as he points out, this is a zipf curve, and as he says, top tasks love them and tiny tasks leave them. And, you know, and that's the kind of advice to managers is, if you can, forget those. And the problem is organizations get tangled up in things like, oh, we need to do a web content inventory. And what that means is you're, you're documenting along the whole thing here. And those doing a web content inventory and finding out what all your web content is and who owns it and when was it updated and does it have all its metadata up to date and so on is an onerous and soul-crushing activity for an organization, right? And it sucks loads of time and effort. So that is the kind of activity that can suck too many resources into things that really don't matter. It doesn't matter who owns this or if the metadata isn't up to date, right? It doesn't matter. A manager's job is to, is to focus on the priority stuff. Um, so this tells us which user tasks to focus on. And, and, it, and the height kind of tells us, or the volume tells us, you know, how much uh, effort to apply or relative resource. And Michael Porter and Steve Jobs said this as well, strategy renders choices about what not to do as important about, as choices about what to do. You have to say no to a hundred things to every yes, you say. Uh, and that's, you know, kind of the argument behind our, you know, focus on, on top tasks. So you can see, over the years, sites have learned about this. 
Once upon a time, if you went to an airline site, you'd have a lovely big hero shot of air hostesses and pilots and things like that, um, or, or destinations. Now, you, you go to Air Canada and any other airline and you get the book, book of flight, right there and centre. Same with hotels. They used to be stuffed with glossy images of their rooms and their scenery and stuff like that. Now, right on the front page, book a room. Okay. Um, universities are struggling a bit. Uh, you know, we know what some of the top tasks are. We've done a lot of work with universities and finding programs is certainly one of them for potential students, but so many universities still have wonderful glossy hero shots and carousels and stuff like that on the front page or news or messages from the dean or something like that. But organizations are gradually learning that, that top tasks really need to be supported well. So Cisco, despite evidence we've given them that 1% of clicks go on these things, right, on the hero shot on the home page, they still have it there. But never mind, they've done some good things. <laughs> so for example, they know what some of the, the, the top tasks are they want to support. But more importantly, we've helped them design their drop-down mega menus over the years and, you know, and define what the main areas are as well. So products and services and the main categories there, you know, some of these things just don't work well. People don't tend to see them at all or care about them. And in particular in support as well, which is a significant web-based activity for Cisco. And one of the things we've kind of helped them innovate there is actually doing some uh, context-specific searches, right? So this is a search for drivers, firmware, what's NOS? I forget, network operating software, I think, and application software. And here to do uh, support for specific products. So we've helped them refine and design these mega menus. So this really is where the top tasks are. So the fact that they still have that massive hero shot doesn't impact things too much because everyone goes straight to the menus anyway. So how did we get to Cisco's top tasks? We have a process, right? So there's a discovery phase where we look at the analytics, we look at surveys, we, look at, we interview stakeholders, we look at competitors, and from that we generate what we call a long list of candidate tasks. And this could be a list of maybe even 500 candidate tasks. Um, and we take that, we refine it down to around 50 to 80, the short list, and we send that out, we invite visitors to the website to complete uh, a response to that and indicate what their top tasks are, and then we use that to define uh, the information architecture in the website. But what I liked about Jerry McGovern and his approach was that it wasn't just, you know, a, a, an academic or, or a... Um, a kind of a neutral approach, it was very much thinking about how do you make change happen within an organization and you need to have buy-in. So part of this was that the stakeholders within the organization are involved through the whole process. So what this means is you get people from the organization generating the potential tasks and of course ordinary people working in, in departments in, in a company don't know what a task is really, they don't have a background in UX or HCI. So there's a lot of education goes on about what is a task and what isn't. And they will tend to start off by you know, referring to pieces of content on the website and saying that's a task. And you can then step back and explain that's not a task, that is, you know, that's a destination which may serve some kinds of users' tasks. And in particular, in the production of the shortlist, what they've had to do is to work together to say we're going to keep these 57 tasks and not those 400. So they've had to make their own judgments about priorities from the viewpoint of the user. So you know the, the challenge is what are of these 500, what are the 60 or so that are most important to your visitors, to your website? Now sometimes you end up with other stuff in there. So for example, if you know, the dean thinks that uh, his message is the most important thing, then you might put that in there just so you can show that at the end of it that it got very few votes. Okay? So sometimes politically you have to be a bit expedient. Yeah? 
Um, it depends on the site. Cisco, Cisco gets millions of visitors, and therefore it was done within a couple of weeks, really. Yeah. But it depends. You know, we look to around 1,400 or so responses. And in particular, it depends if you slice. So, you know, we do demographic stuff. So for a university, we would look at, you know, staff and, and uh, potential students and students maybe in each year. And you want to get maybe uh, at least 100 responses in any of your categories. So that's what tends to determine when we, when we stop it is how finely we've chopped down the categories and making sure we get an adequate response in any one of them. So at the end of it, none of these people can stand up and say, well, I wasn't involved, so I'm not going to commit to this. I'm not going to take any action. A, they've been educated about users and their needs and what tasks are. And B, they've been involved and committed to the process of, of uh, prioritizing from a user's point of view. So it very, is a, very much is a change management role within, within the company. And that's what I liked. You know, my background was more kind of, you know, the um, usability work and UX and so on. So this is what part of that survey looks like. So as I said, they do um, a number of different demographic things. I've just shown one here. Um, and so the question really is just to say, what are the top five resources most important to you in dealing with Cisco? And these are things on the website. And then a list is, is randomly presented. And it's a list of you know, 67 in Cisco's case which kind of flies in the face of most survey design, but there's a, a method to the madness, which is that we want the respondents to be slightly overwhelmed, just as they are when they arrive on a website, right? So we want them not to look line by line and think, oh yeah, do I need downloads more than I need, you know, guides, user guides or something. We don't want them to think. We want them to scan in the same way people scan websites looking for keywords that match what's in their head. So we overload them, and that's why we've picked on the 50 to 80 number. Um, but we have found that the results are amazingly consistent. Um, and we've run more than 400 of these, not us, but us and Jerry and the partners in Europe and in the United States. So we've run more than 400, and they are amazingly consistent in bringing out the top tasks. And then what you find is this, which is another version of that zip graph. So this is the voting for those tasks. These are the top five tasks. The different colors are the quartiles. So you can see the top five tasks got the same votes as the bottom 49, for example. Okay. So this really is one of those uh, hockey stick curves. And the top ones for Cisco were downloading software, firmware, drivers and patches and updates, configuring, pricing, getting specifications and contacting support or support requests. You know, kind of not surprising for a telecoms company, but obviously we have 67 of these. And for example, for my pre-sales uh, testing, you know, there, there's, uh, so there's pre-sales configuration, you know, support deals with that, pricing is something I deal with, specs we do deal with in pre-sales but mainly in support and, you know, that, that will be under support. So we pick, we take the top tasks and, uh, and test those. And the idea, of course, is that having identified those top tasks, you then measure users' performance on them and go into a mode of continuous improvement. And again, another challenge in most organizations is that notion of continuous improvement because the budgeting is often done project by project, year by year. You know, come the, near the end of your financial year, you often don't know if you're going to get any money next year and so on. So that is a challenge. However, there are models, and, and one of the models is the helplines and the help centers in, in companies. And it's a model in a couple of ways. Firstly, it gets continuous funding, right, which may go up and down. They may, you know, get rid of some people or hire some more people on. But also help centers have a, a continuous improvement model because they are where the rubber hits the road with, with, you know, the interface to the customers. They know what the customer problems are. They are rewarded for solving problems quickly. So they generate ways in which to solve problems quickly, including usually finding what the answer is and how to find the answer. 
If you saw the recent Auditor General's report about the uh, revenue agency, you'll see how organizations also game the system to, to, get their, uh, to get their metrics right. I'll tell you. What CRA did, they had a, a you know, which seems like a user-centered user metric of not letting more than 50% of calls have to be waiting for more than two minutes before they're answered. Okay, that was the metric. Sounds good. Once you call them, you shouldn't have to wait more than two minutes to get answered. That's good. But what they did to, to achieve that was they bounced more than 50% of calls. So more than 50% of calls didn't even get through to them. Got a busy tone or just didn't get through. Okay, so they got there, they hit their targets, they made their metrics, but more than 50% of, of calls did not get through at all. Okay. So people do gain the system. Uh, what gets measured gets done, someone said. Uh, and if you've read Freakonomics, yeah, that's a very good description of how metrics make people and organizations do strange things. So for the measuring performance bit, you know, traditional kind of setup for usability testing, um, we do invite and encourage observers because sometimes just that observation can really change someone's attitude within a company. Um, especially a manager or it's valuable for developers who never otherwise get a chance to see people actually interacting and struggling with the products they build and the software. Um, so you know, we schedule these in advance, we aim for, and it's not the number of participants that matters, we aim for 15 task performances of every task. That's the critical thing, uh, not the number of participants, it's the number of task uh, performances you get. So it's scripted, and for benchmarking, you, you, you have to cut down on variation. That's one of the differences between qualitative usability testing and benchmarking. You're aiming to cut down on variation from different sources in order to get consistency from round to round, so that you're consistently measuring the same kind of people, doing the same kinds of tasks, and using the same kind of metrics. So, you know, very carefully scripted and, you know, not, not easy to make changes to the script, or, or it shouldn't be. 45 minutes to an hour. With Cisco, it's, it's always an hour, sometimes a little more. Uh, so we, we generally book 18 to 20 participants because we want those 15 task performances. One or two people will always perform so poorly that there's a couple of tasks they never get to in one hour. And, you know, you have to allow for dropouts as well when you're booking. So 10 to 12 tasks. Uh, we've done some with 13 for Cisco. Uh, we do it remotely and tools have just evolved wonderfully in the last few years to do remote testing. Uh, and in fact now, uh, for the last few months, we are able to test 75% of Android users remotely now, right? which is something we've been waiting for for so long. Um, and we can do that now. Whereas before we had to do mobile testing in a specific location. We had to get people to come downtown in Ottawa, Montreal or somewhere else. But now you can do remote mobile testing. Um, it's on the live site for Cisco. And the tasks are very specific versions of the, the most important and typical tasks. Okay? And the, the tasks and the success criteria must be unambiguous, and that's part of the learning that takes place early on in any of these initiatives, is that when you run pilot tests, or even as you do the testing, you discover that users have unusual interpretations of what you mean by the task. Okay? And it's very, very, uh, it takes quite a lot of effort to keep honing the task. And in fact, we've even got to the point where, in the task, we've bolded the words that need to be emphasized as we speak to the participant so that they get the right words out of the sentence you're saying. And we don't do any think aloud protocol because one of the metrics we're taking is task, time on task. Okay. Task success rate is, is by all, you know, it's the gold standard, but we do take time on task. There's a sample. So a 7600 router crashed after entering the show MPLS forwarding with owner command determine if there are any workarounds for this known issue. So that's a support task. And one of the main sources of variation in any testing is the participants. So testing for Cisco is, is very rigorous and it's, it's 
they, they have a massive database of uh, potential participants in usability tests, but we find once we apply all the criteria we need for the testing, then we're down to small numbers and sometimes scraping the barrel. You know, so for support, uh, well, actually in pre-sales we, we test novices, people who will potentially become customers and partners of Cisco, and we also test experienced people as well. And for support, it's mainly around, it will, you know, it will be people who have Cisco products primarily. So there's you know, a lot of Cisco language for a new customer to learn for them. We typically uh, present these so that they can be there permanently with the user. Either we use chat in WebEx or GoToMeeting so that they can always refer back to the task because some of them are complex. So this task was to find a reseller near you uh, who can support putting in a WebEx meeting server on your site. Okay, that was the task. So this is a, a little video from one of those tests. It's, on, it's only part of the thing. Where is it best for me to do this? Oh, it's mirroring anyway. So let's see how this goes. Product, okay. And even though we don't ask for a think aloud protocol, some people just can't resist telling you what they're doing. So can you see what's going on there? Except that I'm not getting a hit on WebEx meeting server. I'm going to try the acronym which I happen to. Oh, I didn't help either. Product category or Tiny box. Ooh. It often has hundreds of things in that drop down. Yeah, it's in an <laughs> unpredictable order. It contains all kinds of strange stuff. That caps and lowercase, what? Mm. I, I, I do happen to be familiar with Cisco WebEx, Cisco WebEx meeting server, CWMS, yeah. as a product. So I know that that's a valid product, but I'm not seeing that come up here. Mm -hmm. It seems like, it, it really feels like the place the proper place to find that information, but I'm not finding that product come up here. Um, I, uh, I might, I might go ahead and try WebEx Meeting Center and just see what I get. Oh, I get nothing. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I search tips. Enter a keyword. Enter a zip code. Well. Yeah, it's done. You know, to do that, mm -hmm. um, advanced criteria. Let's, okay, here we go. Let's oh no! Criteria. And when you're testing this kind of thing, um, you know, you go, oh no, not advanced, no, because you know they're they're never going to come out of it. <laughs> there are there are hundreds of parameters in here, okay. hundreds of things. Well, right, we're only on A, A here. Uh, okay, this so. quickly goes. Um, one of the, the things you really have to do is to know the tasks inside out before you start testing. A, so you know, uh, you know how, what success means, and B, so you know all the potential paths that, that users are likely to take, and even so, they will surprise you in, in test sessions. Wow, that's not very many, neither of them are close. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And you also... Feeling a little, a bit... Uh, I'm not really getting uh, the type of information that, that I'm looking for here. I, I might be at a point here where I might be getting close to where I would just go out and Google something. Since I'm, I think I found the proper place where it should be, where I feel it should be on the Cisco website, but I'm not finding... Um, oh, wait. What's this? This, what, this is my... Additional partner for. programs. A little more specific uh, product type information here in this section. No, again, see there I have three listings for WebEx, but neither of them are the one specific WebEx product that uh, that I've been asked about. So, um, but I think I think at this point, I would probably 
the uh, I might just try a Google search. Okay. So those, all those drop downs were generated from databases that Cisco have of partner programs, of rewards programs, of stuff like that, with absolutely no thought as to the user experience whatsoever. Okay. So it was done you know, very well, quickly, on time, on budget, probably, and it works. And that was really enough to get it out there. This is actually way better than it used to be. This used to be horrendous. But, those, but the advanced things is, is what needs fixing next, really. So that guy left to Google. And one of the things you have to decide is uh, things like, where do you start? So do we start them on a blank tab and just let them do whatever they would uh, from Google, perhaps? Or do we start from the home page of a website? or do we start from a, a subsection of a website? And a lot of that depends on what it is you're trying to measure and what you want to get out of the results, okay? So, you know, I, in the ideal world, you would give people a blank page and say, you know, try and find the answer to this, this task. But that may not tell you much about the things you need to change in your organization. If they go to Google, and we tried this recently with government on one project, started them all from a blank tab, loads of people went straight to Google, and all that really told us was about the search engine optimization aspects of the website. It didn't tell us much about navigation and the information architecture and the usability of the content. Okay. So, you know, again, it's a trade-off. And you have to decide, uh, well, you don't have to actually. It could be just success and fail, but we have a number of different fail codes. We set a five minute time li limit on every task and that, that's a long time. But people can hit the time limit, they can give up, and that was counted as a give up for Cisco. If someone has to go to Google to find the answer, then that's a, a give up. Um, time limit, they can give the wrong answer, and it might either be a minor wrong, or for, for Cisco, we define what we call disasters, which is where they've got the wrong answer and it would have a significant impact. So maybe they would order a product that's no longer uh, available, or they'd order the wrong product you know, because they'd found an old piece of information, or they'd order the wrong product because the configuration information wasn't right. And that would cause a significant problem for them, and possibly for Cisco, having to sort the mess out. Yeah? If you don't ask um, them to think about how do you know why they think the way to do, why they're looking at the information this way? Um, you, 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 often don't know, you often don't need to know why. It's often enough to know that 80% of people click on that stupid link because it's got this word in it that matches. So, you know, you apply your, your experience and knowledge of psychology and, and UX. But we do say at the beginning, uh, and this is to help them not think aloud, we do say, you know, after each task, we can talk about some of the interesting things, yeah? So that's when we would say, why did you go back from that page? And, you know, or why did you click on that link? So there is an opportunity to do it after each task. And what we end up with is um, performance metrics. So these are tasks, these are 13 tasks, I think, and color coding for each of the types of failure as well. And already this gives you an idea for, you know, which tasks need fixing, but also that this, because it's time out or gave up, this is a findability issue here, whereas this one, most of the uh, failures are because they, they found the wrong answer. And working with uh, the government of Canada, they have made a clear distinction between findability uh, versus task success. Because findability is often owned by the treasury board and a senior team of, of UX or other folk in the organization, whereas the content on the page is owned by individual authors. So we're measuring if people are able to find the right destination separately from are they able to complete the task successfully. Failure codes, time on task. We also measure confidence as well, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I also like to track event codes as well, because once you've done the research up front and you know how tasks are going to go, you know, for example, you know, there's a crappy marketing page. If people ever get to that, then I know they're going to head off in this direction. So, 
it's useful to be able to record some of those significant events that you know are signposts in the uh, interaction. So at the end of it, you can put it all in a pivot table in Excel and say, how many people in task seven clicked on, got to that page? Or overall tasks, how many people went to that page? And how many of them succeeded or failed? So you can have some kind of model or correlation there. So what we do then for Cisco is we, we produce what we call a task performance indicator, which is a single metric for each task that represents uh, the, the success of that task. So, you know, overall we had 28% successes on this task. Uh, these failures are all, I think, all right, there are, there are two lots there. So six people gave up, six timed out or hadn't got to the complete answer. Uh, and one person got the wrong answer in a significant way. So what this task performance metric really is, is 100, okay? We start off with 100. And then for every failure, this is the dead simple bit, you simply take 1 one eighteenth off. So you take 5.6% off or something, okay? So, and you just reduce the score. So nothing magical about that. Now down here, so we have then some algorithms that we've worked out over time that firstly just penalize for longer time on task, but also at the end of each task we ask people how confident they are that they found the right answer. And they can say either very confident, um, reasonably confident, or not sure, and they might find some other way to, to confirm it. If people find the right answer, but they're not confident, then we take the score down a little. If they find the wrong answer and they're very confident, we take the score down a bit, okay? So confidence does play into the overall metric, um, but only in, only in relative minor ways. It really is about success. And what one of their departments like, likes to have a, a, <laughs> a fun way of showing the state of each task whether it's... Uh, yeah. uh, so this one is down in last rights, unfortunately. It really is at death's door. Um, and they think it helps communicate it better, which is great. And, you know, typically have targets uh, that, that they can then set for the next financial year. And one of the interesting things at Cisco is that there are people who have responsibility for task performance. Right? That's a change in our organisations. You know, a lot of startups have this anyway. The user experience is so critical that they have people who are responsible for the user experience and uh, its subcomponents. But this is new for organizations that have been around, you know, a long time, giving people responsibility for that. And the point, of course, as I said, this is continuous improvement over a period of time. This is an example, the finding the bug information um, of how that went. So you can see you know, it goes up and down, and we, st we estimate that with, even with 15 to 20 task performances, you're going to get variation of 1 to 2 people, so around 11, 12%, right? So it's not statistically, uh, you know, nailed down. Uh, Jeff Sorrow is the real expert on, on statistics for usability and user experience. And as he shows, you know, you, there's no real step function that says once, you know, there's the early thing of if, if you get three to five users, then you can find some usability pro issues and maybe 80% maybe of usability issues, which is great. And then the curve, you know, tails off like that. And there's no step function that says you need 12 people or 20 until you get to around 93, right? And there's no way we're going to test with 93 people on every thing like this, you know, Cisco couldn't afford to do that. So 19, 18 works for us, it allows for about 11, 12% variation. Um, and sometimes things happen like this, you know, so variance is going up and down and then suddenly 50% uh, and then what? 6% and 13 and then it heads back up again. Well, what happened was they actually ran a pilot test to simulate a possible solution and it worked, okay? But then they weren't able to, oh, they weren't able to implement the pilot for a year. And again, that's typical in a large organization. The IT folks are completely overloaded and overwhelmed. They have their annual budget. They have all their projects defined for the next six months. You may get squeezed in in eight months' time if you're lucky. 
So that was an example of that continuous Im improvement. Here's another example, and this was an unusual one. So creating a new account, pretty significant, simple um, activity. This is one we test only with novice participants. This is how the scoring on that went. So zero success rate here, 50, 29, and, and 50 again, success rate. And why that was, was because they had a long form you had to fill in with 22 fields. Okay. And then for this one, they piloted a short form, and there were also three specific design improvements as well as uh, on the form. Then they went back to the long form, but kept the three design improvements. And then finally they went back to the short form, they actually implemented it. This again was a pilot, and again it took a year to, to implement it. Okay. This was great because what it allowed us to do was to say, okay, so the three design improvements contributed maybe 29% of the success rate and 21% was contributed by the short form versus the long form. It's not often you get that kind of A-B testing where you can pull out the different factors. And that was the, the long one. 22 mandatory fields, and that was the new one. But what they also did was they, they improved the password strength indicator. They fixed uh, an error to do with addresses, and they also made it clearer which fields were mandatory. But what you find, and I'm not sure if this is on the slide, yeah, is Steve Krug, Don't Make Me Think, great book, is that a lot of the usability improvements are cumulative. So the, f the fact that the f the, this form was so long meant that participants started to think, which fields can I skip? Right? How can I get through this as quickly as I can? And that was where they started to make errors. So you're forcing the person to think, even at a meta level, about how can I get through this damn form quickly? What we found here was that it... So Showing clearly which ones were mandatory and not was important for this form. For this one, it's actually not important because people see at a glance that it's short, so they don't start to think, how can I skip some of the fields here? So they don't even need to know which is mandatory and which isn't. And a lot of uh, UX design is, is kind of like that. It's cumulative and it impacts other aspects of the cognitive processes that go on. So. They're also, <laughs> you know, internally, the simpler a form is, the less likely the designers are to make a mistake of <laughs> the interaction. So there are benefits internally as well. Uh, shorter time on form, so they're less likely then to hit the five minute time limit, completing the rest of the task. Uh, and so, you know, you hypothesize things, they might be more likely to register, fewer calls to the help desk perhaps, fewer abandonments. And in fact, they were able to show that as a result of implementing that, they halved the number of calls to the help desk that were about the registration process. And it's brilliant when you can do that because that's a real you know, financial bottom line issue. They, they also showed that so the number of tickets halved, time to register on average, so they could harness this and measure time to completion uh, from 3.25 to 2 minutes. Registration completion was more than doubled, so they got more people registering for an account on their site as well, which has unknown future sales and marketing and partnership value. And, you know, so three people less required to support, that doesn't mean they got the sack, but it means that they can now support the other more significant problems that, that clients and customers have. And. You know, in summary, we're not trying to be, uh, you know, it's not just about UX and usability, it's about changing organisations. And there's been a, you know, a gradual recognition that organisations need to change in order to deliver a great user experience, yeah? Good question. Uh, for that um, drop down below that chart where you fill in your information to create an account, can it divide that into like multiple pages and still have the same amount of questions? Is I think short, brief, Going yeah, uh, they could have. What you mean in the registration thing? You could have a long format, but except having a one long page, you could have three or four short pages. You could. 
You could. But, and this is what you find, a lot of the things it was asking was really for the marketing department. It wasn't, you know, the minimum viable information needed to set up an account. It was, oh, marketing, we'd really like to know, you know, how old they are and, and where do they live and things like that. Whereas if you look at Amazon and other companies, they take a gradual, gradual approach. You give them the minimum, and then on, on like social media sites, they kind of, or LinkedIn, you know, it will say, oh, you filled in 70% of your profile, but you know, we did, which university did you go to? Just gradually try and add a bit more information as the person interacts with you more, and either you give them something valuable in, in response to that, or you know, they've interacted you with so long that they're obviously finding you valuable and may be prepared to provide more information. So you're right, and of course there are tricks to make people fill out longer forms by splitting them up and you know, by making it look easy and a little bit harder. And, and then once you give them the hard stuff, they're already committed. Right? So there are psychological tricks to, to encourage that behavior. Right. Right? Yeah, that's right. And that's what we do with the task poll, actually. Right? We get them committed before we give them this 67 thing. Because we found if you give them the 67 tasks up front, they back off then. But once they've committed to a certain extent, people are more likely to, to fill it. Okay. Are we? Yeah, well, this is pretty much it, actually. Um, so the important aspect of this is that it's not, uh, it's, it's not an academic exercise. It really is about business. And, and as Bill Skeet at Cisco says, it allows you to be a manager, to set goals, prioritize actions, and does he say it here? He basically said it, uh, Oh, you can prove you're managing the website, not the other way around. Okay. So as a manager, it's really valuable for him. Just recently, uh, January the 3rd, Jerry McGovern, who has, that's his latest book, he actually published chapter 16, which is all about Cisco. So if I'd known, I wouldn't have bothered putting any slides together. I'd, I'd waited for his. But actually, I've given a similar presentation uh, before, so that wasn't too hard. I've also put some uh, resources in there. There is a UX blog at Cisco there. That's Jerry's article on, on Medium. And some more information about this kind of approach. Customer Care Words is Jeremy Govan's uh, um, <coughs> company. I'm actually bringing him over again in February to work with the Treasury Board and the new um, CDS, uh, the Digital Services Group within government as well, and with uh, Privy, uh, Privy Council office and, and some others. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs>